Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pearson's Learning Makes Us webinar series. Today's session is Draw to Learn in the Anatomy Laboratory and is being presented by Michael Wood. Michael G. Wood is a professor of biology at Del Mar College in Corpus Christi, Texas, where he has taught anatomy and physiology and biology for over 30 years. He has received the Educator of the Year, Teacher of the Year, and Master Teacher Awards from the Del Mar College student body and from the local business community. He received his MS at Pan American University, which is now the University of Texas at Pan American, where his graduate studies included vertebrate physiology and freshwater ecology. Michael is a member of the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society and is author of Laboratory Manual for Anatomy and Physiology featuring Martini Art, the latest edition of which just published in January of 2016. And without further delay, Mike, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Aurora. Well, welcome webinar participants. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and, and to do this webinar. Um, so as Aurora said, I teach anatomy and physiology here at Del Mar College over 30 years, and I do lots of drawing in the laboratory. And so my goal in this webinar is to get you drawing as well. Well, let's see if this webinar is for you. Are you not already drawing in the lab or even in lecture? Maybe you feel you have no drawing talent. Are you looking for new approaches to the same old material? You know, after teaching for 30 years, you know, we teach the same stuff. Always looking for new ways to do things. You might feel frustrated in lab or lecture constantly repeating yourself in class. Drawing can really address that. Do you want to increase student engagement? These are all good reasons for drawing in the laboratory. We're going to talk about the lab today. You can also do drawing in lecture, and I do a lot of drawing in lecture. Well, let's look at the science behind drawing. Um, there is a, a major paper in science in August 2011, Drawing to Learn in Science, um, by Sharon Wainsworth and, and Prane and, and Teitler, uh, and uh, they were looking at the role of drawing and learning. Let's see what they came up with. So they conclude that drawing engages the learner, helps to represent science, builds reasoning skills, drawing is a great learning strategy, and helps us communicate information. So let's take a moment and, and, and look at each of these. Well, drawing definitely fosters engagement. Students are more involved, they're more motivated. So when we draw in the laboratory, you know, students, boy, I, I hear them getting out their colored pencils, they're starting a fresh page so they can really draw, draw, you know, and isolate that drawing on a clean page. They're talking with their lab partners, comparing their drawing with, with theirs. You can see my teaching tip on the screen. When we do drawing, I like to draw something like, say, maybe mitosis. I draw it out on the marker board, and then I have students get their microscopes and their slides and they look at it. So drawing definitely fosters engagement. I also draw to represent. So sketching uh, you know, gives us a visual model, helps us understand, interpret these scientific illustrations. And you know, in the lecture book and the lab manuals, we see these complex drawings like you see here on the screen with cardiovascular uh, you know, on blood flow. Pretty complicated. Students often look at this and don't know where to begin. And so if you do more drawing in class, it gives them an idea of where to start with something. We draw for reason, and that reason is, is developing these reasoning skills. You know, a lot of students in anatomy and physiology, they think they're just going to memorize anatomy. Well, we know it's way beyond that. We've got to teach, you know, the anatomical organization, how is this structure related to, related to a nearby structure. So drawing helps students build those reasoning skills, comparing things, attention to detail. These are all skills that scientists use. Drawing is a way uh, to have another learning strategy. We read it, we draw it, we observe it. And so, you know, our, our, our drawings put our sketches into words. Uh, our, our sketches put our words into a visual context. And, you know, students have ownership of their drawings. They tend to be proud of their sketches. And, uh, again, they compare it with their classmates. And as I tell my students, if you can draw it, that means you know it. And we definitely draw to communicate. And so this gives us a window in students' thinking. You know, imagine going and looking at a student's drawing, and, and they have a, uh, an error on their drawing. And maybe it's, it was a preconceived uh, error that they had. And so... You know, you can show them that in their drawing and, and make that correction. So that gave us a window into their mind of how they're thinking about all this. 
we've all heard a picture is worth a thousand words, and boy, that is so true in science. And as I like to say, don't we already have enough words pouring out of our mouth during class? I mean, it's just like words after words. Sometimes we need to pause. Let's do a sketch. Let's approach this in a different way. So, to summarize the science behind the drawing, drawing engages students. They're more active in the classroom. Drawing represents complex uh, scientific processes. Drawing builds reasoning skills. It's a great learning strategy. It definitely helps us communicate complicated material. But you might be thinking, what? Me draw? Draw? I can't draw. What am I supposed to draw? Draw what? Often we feel like, well, we're the science expert, and so, but I'm not a master artist, so why am I expected to draw in class? You might even say, why draw when, when hey, that wood lab manual has such great art and photographs? I say, well, drawing takes up too much time. I barely have time to get through the material that, I, that I'm uh, you know, teaching. How can I have time for drawing? You might even say, hey, this is anatomy and physiology lab, not art studio. Well, let's see. With our drawing, no artistic talent required. And as I tell my students, we're not drawing art. We're not, we're not doing masterpieces. We're drawing sketches, simple representation. So drawing is just one of many learning modalities. The point of our drawing is to learn visually, not to create a masterpiece. Keep the drawings really simple, simple lines, circles. We make cartoon sketches. So we draw and record observations. You know, these are very important components of scientific procedures. We draw and teach. Students are connected more with their lab observations when they draw it. They look in the microscope and they draw it. You know, if you, and if you don't help students with their drawings, they might just draw basically what looks like scribble as they look through the microscope. But we can help them with their um, powers of observation to do some more accurately. Drawing actually saves me time in lab because students do the work and they learn it. Instead of me pouring out all those words again, we do a sketch of it. And then when students ask me questions, I, I go right back and back to their drawing. I say, look at that. We look, you know, how is, for instance, you know, um, anaphase and telophase different if you're studying mitosis. I say, show me in your drawing how they're different, and then they can show me on the microscope. So I refer back to the drawing to answer questions things like that in lab. And then they're referring back to their own work. That cuts down on the repetition of answering the same question again and again, because many of the students get it when they draw it. So keep it simple when you're drawing. Simple circles, simple lines. Everybody can do these sketches. So let's sketch. I start drawing first day of lab. And so you know, we, we, we talk about organization of the body. We do planes of section. Let's do some sketches of planes of section. So I'm going to toggle over now to my document camera. And so let's draw planes of section. Simple shapes. Imagine doing a plane this way. So we just separated right from left. And so here we have, it's a mid-sagittal. I'll just write sagittal section. We cut this way and separate superior from inferior. Of course, in class, I would spell these terms out. Okay, I'm going to abbreviate some during our workshop just to save some time here. But separate superior from inferior, and that's transverse section. We cut this way, and now we separated anterior from posterior, and we're looking at frontal sections. You know, so many times in lab, and of course here we're first week of lab, students, they just don't get the sections. They don't get these planes of section. So we go back to our drawing, and I say, okay, what does sagittal separate? Oh, right and left. What does transverse separate? Superior from inferior frontal sections, anterior from posterior. Then they can go back to the models that, that I've, I've tagged with that, that have different sections on them, and they can understand the material. Uh, 
uh, in, my, in my PowerPoint, I have some of the sketches from last time so that we can do easy comparisons. And by the way, my, my PowerPoint's available at the end of the webinar. And so we've got our planes and sections. Again, simple lines, simple shapes. Everybody can do this. Well, the next week in lab, I'd be teaching uh, cells. I draw out stages of mitosis. Then we get to tissues. Of course, this is very challenging. Students looking through the microscope, uh, drawing these tissues. Uh, so I draw out each tissue that we look at. Here's simple cuboidal epithelium. Let's uh, see how we can simply draw this one. Again, simple shapes. So I could draw this cell by cell. But you can see this technique, I can get the drawing pretty quick. The cells aren't quite as square or cube-like as they could be. Let's get a big old nucleus in the middle of each. So here we have this section of simple cuboidal epithelium. I even add the basement membrane on the outside. So simple cuboidal epithelium and basement membrane. Let me finish spelling epithelium. So very simple sketch. After we do a bunch of these sketches, I'll ask students, you know, does that look like our, you know, what you're seeing in the microscope? Yeah, they'll tell me, yeah, you know, we know it's not a perfect representation, kind of a cartoon sketch, but it certainly works. And as I tell students, by doing this, we get that image in our mind. It's much easier to get this cartoon image in our mind than it is to get that, you know, um, uh, microscopic view in our mind. Uh, continuing on with tissues, the areolar tissue, I always sketch this tissue. I usually start by making some, some thick lines for collagen fibers. I'll put some fibroblasts up in there. Little squiggly lines for elastic fibers. I remind my students to be complete with their names. It's just not collagen, but a collagen fiber, an elastic fiber. And so here we have areolar tissue. I tell students this tissue is like a bowl of spaghetti and meatballs, and the cells are the meatballs, but mostly what we have on our plate are all the noodles, so these protein fibers are all the noodles embedded in the, the ground substance, which would be the, the uh, spaghetti sauce. They really like that analogy. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. And so there's areolar tissue. And again, here's a sketch that I did uh, last time. It's very similar to my current one. With hyaline cartilage, students can understand the structure of cartilage and that helps them with the structure of bone. So let's take a look at, at how we could draw hyaline cartilage. Sometimes I draw it across this way, other times vertically. I think I'll draw it vertically today. So just drawing some simple lines to represent the perichondrium. Up in that perichondrium, we have little flat chondroblasts. Oops, that's, I said blast, so I better point to two of them. I'll put some over here as well. And, of course, in the middle of the tissue, we have our chondrocytes. I tell students the chondroblasts become the chondrocytes. Each chondrocyte is in its little pocket or space. 
the lacuna. And then I usually would use use like red and just fill in with all the, the gel matrix all around that. I won't fill it in around the labeling. So there's our gel matrix. And let's label. Hyaline cartilage. There's our Hyaline cartilage. So let's go back, compare it with our actual micrograph. There we go. So pretty good representation. Again, a simple representation, simple lines, simple circles. Students can do this sketch. I think my current sketch is a little better than the one I have on the screen. With the integumentary system, you can do some sketches. So you might look at, at the skin model and go, well, there's too much detail there for me to sketch. Let's simplify it. Remember, the goal for sketching is to simplify the structure so students clearly see what they're responsible for. So let's do the skin. Awesome. So there's our epidermis. We've got a hair follicle going on here. Let's put a hair in it. All right. I'm going to attach an erector pili muscle to that hair follicle. And let's put a sebaceous gland next to it. And so here's our epidermis. And we could get into the layers. You know, here's our stratum basale, stratum corneum. You could add more layers if you want. I talk about all the epidermal layers in lecture class, but in lab I just have them identify the, the, the deep and superficial layers. Here's our sebaceous gland. You see the hair. hair follicle, erector pili muscle. You know what? We identified epidermis, so let's come down here. And there's the dermis. I can even put some adipose tissue down here. I'll just put a little bit here on my, on my image. And so here's the hypodermis. So we took something that at first looks pretty complicated, lots of structures there, and we simplified it with our sketch. I could add a sweat gland to it. In fact, let's go back to, to our picture. Let's add a sweat gland. I'll just put it over here. Normally it would be a little deeper, but you might be wondering, well, how do you do the sweat gland? I just do a knot and have that come on up. Here's our sweat gland. Okay, and there's a simple, simple sketch. So moving on to the skeleton. Now I admit I can't draw the skull, uh, you know, in any detail that has some anatomical, um, you know, accuracy to it. Um, but once I get on, I, I draw vertebrae. Once we get to the appendicular bones, I can definitely draw these. I'm showing you this drawing um, intentionally because it's, it's really not a very good one, but it got the point across. I did this one the other day in lab, just real quick. It didn't take me 30 seconds on the board. Um, and so I was, I was discussing the girdles. And so we have two pectoral girdles and one pelvic girdle. And so just a quick sketch to demonstrate that and how the girdles are hanging off of the appendicular skeleton. Again, not the best sketch in the world. In fact, when I did this one, students laughed. Uh, that's okay. We have fun in lab. And uh, it's okay to, to do a sketch that's, that's not the best, but it represents. It represents the organization that we want students to learn. Here's the, uh, the femur. 
Let's draw a couple other bones. I really enjoy drawing the bones. Let's draw the, uh, the, the humerus. Eh, it's looking a little more like the femur. That's okay. Let me make a little adjustment here. There we go. And so we got our specific parts of the condyle down here. So here's our our head, medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle. Trochlea, that's a CH there. And we've got our capitulum. We've got our fossa there. Coronoid fossa. And I tell students, you know, put your finger on the head. They learn that's a medial structure, and so then we can go straight down to the medial epicondyle. Let's draw the tibia. And so we see here's our tibial tuberosity. And we've got our medial condyle, lateral condyle, and then down here we see here's our medial malleolus. And again, I tell students, find that medial condyle, go straight down, there's your medial malleolus. So the drawings help um, the students understand that we use anatomical references. You know, you find that medial malleolus, and then you know that's the medial condyle. Okay. Also draw muscles to show direction of muscle fibers. And with the abdominal muscles, as we know, these muscles uh, that are lateral to the rectus abdominis overlap each other at right angles, kind of like layers in a sheet of plywood. So let's see how we could represent that. So here's the rectus abdominis muscle. There's our umbilicus. It's the rectus abdominis. And you know the... the uh, We have our external oblique muscle. It's oriented so the fibers are pointing outward. So here's the superficial layer. And we have our external oblique. Let's draw another rectus abdominis. And now the internal obliques are directing in. I tell my, my students, put your finger at the bottom of the muscle and let the, the, the grain, the fascicles of the muscle, uh, show you the direction the muscle is heading. So this is our middle layer. And we have the internal oblique. Again, I'd spell all these terms out. And now with our transverse abdominis, transversus abdominis, here's our deep layer. So it didn't take us long to do this sketch, but look what we've got out of it. We're reviewing anatomical terms, superficial, middle, and deep. We're talking about the direction of the muscle fibers. And we could see how the superficial layer, its fibers are at a direction opposite of the middle layer. Okay, 
external oblique runs this way, internal oblique that way. So it really shows the organization of the muscles. And it gives students a method of determining and identifying these muscles. So we've just taught students how to move away from memorization. This muscle is that, don't know why, but this, this other one is, is another muscle. Now they see the organization of these muscle layers. Here's hey Mike, six. sorry to cut uh -huh. in here. Uh -huh. um, I just wanted to let you know we have about five more minutes and then we'll want to oh, okay. get into Q&A. Okay, well great. I get so lost in drawing that it's, uh, 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 time can fly. My students tell me that too. Um, so now I'm just going to page through some, some other sketches that I like to do in class. Uh, we do the spinal cord and here we see uh, a spinal cord drawing. I really separate the dorsal and ventral roots, so we have, have, have lots of separation there so that students can do their labeling. You can see over on the, the left side of the drawing itself, um, the, the rami labeled. Over on the right side, I do a little reflex. And so I start introducing uh, spinal reflexes. And so when we get to lecture class, not only do they know the anatomy, but we took a few moments and did the reflex there as well. Um, in our part two anatomy and physiology, we start with sensory, and day one, I'm on that board drawing. So here we have our, our model of the, of the eye and the orbit with all of its uh, external anatomy, the lacrimal apparatus. And so, and this one, I, I, um, sometimes I'll just draw in the number and add a key. And so that's easy. So now students, you know, they understand the, the lacrimal punctum to the lacrimal canaliculus to the, to the lacrimal sac to the nasal lacrimal duct. They get it. I'm teaching um, blood flow through the heart. I do this in the laboratory, and um, yeah, I do a box, uh, but we see the, the uh, two blood flows with the pulmonary circuit and the uh, systemic circuit of blood flow. And as we go through this, I'd add, add valves and label the valves and everything. Just finished working with our vascular models. Here's a simple sketch with the three branches off the aortic arch. Very easy to do, so we do these stick drawings. Students get on that wireman model, as we call it. They get right to it, because they use their lab manual as a reference. We never forget about the lab manual, uh, and then we supplement that with our sketches. Just a few more, and we'll wrap it up here. Here's some of my, my, uh, my own notes that I use, uh, just as reference for when I'm drawing our, our stick man arteries and veins. Differences between lungs, that can be simply drawn. Of course, I would label that. Getting into the anatomy of, of the bile ducts and hepatic ducts. And so by this time in the semester, students have gotten pretty good about sketching. In fact, they often ask, are we going to sketch this? Or can you please sketch that? They're really looking forward to doing the drawings because they know they learn a lot through this way. Always draw the nephron in lab. If they would go into lecture sketch it again real quick. We add our physiology on it. Well, we're about out of time. I'd like to thank you for participating in the, the webinar. Um, hopefully this gives you some um, insight and some incentive to start drawing. Start drawing in your lab tomorrow. Keep your sketches simple. Get feedback from students. Ask them, Does, is this a, 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 a good but simple representation of what you're seeing. Did this help you understand and learn the material? I bet you get positive feedback. I do all the time for my students. I'd like to thank Pearson Publishing uh, for the webinar. Uh, our, our MC, uh, Aurora Queen with Media Services, has been running the webinar for us. Thank you, Aurora, for all your uh, help and expertise today. Uh, Allison Rona, Executive Marketing Director. Uh, Cheryl Chuck uh, Vala, she's our senior acquisition editor. Uh, I've gotten a lot of help from Ben Robach here at Del Mar College, where I'm at. He's our, one of our IT guys. And I also thank Del Mar College for um, all the years of opportunity to teach uh, anatomy and physiology. Well, thanks again, folks. I really enjoyed it. And um, I will send Aurora the PowerPoint so you have access to that, and it'll have copies of my sketches in there. Keep on sketching. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, do you have time for questions, Mike? Because we do have yes, some I questions do. that have come yeah. in. Okay, great. Yeah, you were absolutely. saying goodbye, so I didn't want you to run off there. No, um, I'm here. As Mike, <laughs> okay, good. As Mike mentioned, we will uh, send you a follow-up email that will have a link to the recording 
when it's ready and also a link to that PowerPoint so you can download the PDF and have a copy of that if you're interested in looking at those drawings again. So here we have a question, are there any studies that show coloring equal to or comparable to drawing or using simple pictures which students add to? I haven't, I haven't researched that um, in the literature on the internet, but I would, I would be surprised if there's not that, that um, research out there. Uh, we've all seen the, the AMP coloring books. Uh, I, I think they're very useful. As I tell my students, you know, sometimes you're too tired to read that lecture book or that lab manual, but, but you know you need to do some study. Get out that coloring book and do some coloring. So I, I you know, and, and we see doctors' offices use color coding on their files. So I think I think color is 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 excellent to add uh, into drawings, or just you know, give students a, a picture of the skull and have them color the different bones and different structures. So I, I think that's worthwhile. I've done that with muscles. I've given them a picture of the muscle man and require them to use three to five different colors. So they color each muscle differently. That helps them see the definition of that muscle and its boundaries. Um, and it's going to take them a little bit more time, so they're not going to scribble on it with, you know, right before lab with their ink pen. Um, so they use some colors, do a nice piece of work with that. I absolutely use colors. Yeah, I use black and red and blue on the board all the time. Great question. Great, thank you. So by taking out the time to draw almost every structure in A&P, how do you balance between lecture time and working with model? Yeah, well, there's only certain things that I draw. Um, so, yeah, we definitely don't have time to draw everything. And the things I draw are, you know, truthfully, they're things I feel like I can draw. Like I said, I, I, I can't draw the skull, at least not in an anatomically accurate way that's going to help students. So I don't use, you know, do, do a drawing of that. I, I certainly can't draw all the muscles and things. And, and sometimes I see my students' drawings are, are so much better than mine, it's almost embarrassing. But we're not trying to do a masterpiece. We're, we're, we're teaching anatomy and physiology, and we can do it through this visual way of, of drawing. So, you know, in lab, like with the eye, I, you know, I showed you the drawing of the lacrimal apparatus. Um, then I draw the, the cellular organization of the retina. And that's what I do for the, for the eye. For the ear, I draw semicircular canals, show them the ampulla, uh, where the crista is located. And then we draw the cochlea. And, uh, and so I'm not trying to draw all the external anatomy and all the ossicles and everything. So I kind of have to pick and choose. Yeah. So I recommend for faculty to, to do some drawings at first that, they're, that are real easy, that they're comfortable with. And, and as they start getting into it, that will kind of open up the mind to seeing more things to draw. Or, or you recognize a problem area that students always have. And maybe that's something you can sketch. So. Um, uh, it'll help students, and they can refer back to their sketches as they're working on the models. Perfect, thanks. So do you ask the students to sketch on exams or quizzes? Um, I have in the past, but my teaching load, my student load is so heavy right now with uh, 150 students per semester that that's, that's a lot of grading. I already, I already grade, you know, lots of lab tests. And, um, but um, uh, I do... I do like to have students draw on exams, and uh, even in lecture class, you know, draw the plasma membrane um, as represented in class. Um, you know, maybe I give them a little uh, some sequence of, of nitrogen bases, and they need to draw draw those in with a uh, on the DNA strands. Um, so, so what I do now, I draw in in, in both lecture and, and lab. And often I'll take one of our lecture drawings and put that on the test, and then then I might ask them to to maybe label it through multiple choice, you know, what is number four on the drawing, uh, or I might ask them what's happening here. And I do that quite a bit in lecture. I'll take one of our sketches and then I'll turn it into a, a physiology sketch, you know, what's happening here, what's happening here. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. So one last question here. Have you ever used drawings to replace the lab manual? No. No, the lab manual is real important. Um, in fact, I have students compare their drawings with the photographs and the micrographs in the lab manual. So I'm, a, I'm big on reading. I tell students they need to read the lecture book, they need to read the lab manual, you know, and we talk about how to do that reading. Obviously, we don't read these books like a, a, a novel, um, but I, I still feel the lab manual is very important. It gives them 
uh, the scientific language uh, along with the you know embedded in with the with the English language. I tell students readings like athletics. If if you're not a pleasure reader, then you're kind of out of shape academically for your reading. So read your lab manual, read your lecture book. But yeah, we always have that lab manual open even when we're doing our sketches. And the the Wood Lab Manual has lots of places for students to do their sketches. Mostly places for the uh, micrographs. Uh, the sketches that they that they're going to make as they look through the through the microscope. So we have a draw it feature in the lab manual for that. In the review sheets uh, at the end of each exercise, there's also places for students to draw. So drawing is a component of the laboratory manual as well. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. So any last words for us before I close it out here? Well, I just like to um, encourage everybody to draw. Uh, again, we're not doing art; we're doing simple representation. So, pick up that uh, dry erase marker and hit the marker board and make some lines and circles and and draw. Your students will thank you for it. Thanks again, folks. Have a great day. Enjoy your teaching. Bye bye. And I'd like to I'd like to thank you, Mike, for a great presentation today, and thank you all to all of you for attending. On behalf of Pearson, I thank you again for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.